everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Writer's Chat. We're so glad that you're here with us today. I'm Johnny Alexander, and I'm joined by two special co-hosts this morning, Melissa Stroh, who is our Director of Communications. Wave, Melissa. <laughs> and Norma Poor, who is our Almost an Author Liaison. And I just am very thankful for both of these ladies for stepping in. They do a lot of the behind the scenes work that nobody really knows about. And we just appreciate them so much. And then our special guest today is Valerie Frazier Lussie. And we're very excited to have her with us. We're going to be talking about travel tips today and, um, you know, travel writing and, and also about Valerie's writing journey. She's a novelist. She has two books out. Missing Isaac and Almost Home is her late release. I had the privilege of uh, interviewing her on my Novelist and Wine site, and I do encourage you to go check out that interview. For one thing, Valerie has this wonderful little spot called her Story Shack, and it's just this one room little place, and she did you know, turn the camera around and kind of show it to us, and that was a lot of fun and made me very jealous. But anyway... <laughs> Valerie is an award-winning magazine uh, writer. She's the senior travel editor for Southern Living Magazine. She writes about what she calls the unique pockets of Southern culture. And in 2009, the Southeast Tourism Society gave her the 2009 Writer of the Year Award for her um, editorial section on Hurricane Katrina recovery. So she is a very accomplished writer who kind of came to novel writing along that path. So we, Valerie, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. This is exciting. I'm looking forward to chatting again. We had such a fun visit last time. We did. We did. It was it was really fun. So uh, I'll put that link in the chat in just a bit because you guys will want to go see that. Just starting out, tell us about how you got uh, started writing and how you got involved with Southern Living Magazine. Okay. Um, I always wanted to write and it was always my my interest and so I studied English literature in college uh, at Auburn and Baylor uh, but I always wanted to work, work for Southern Living because I wanted to write about the South and this was the biggest magazine in in our area you know if you didn't want to move to New York you pretty much you know Southern Living was was definitely the place to go and so um, I tried over the years back then I Uh -oh. employment section read the obituaries because <laughs> nobody left until they passed on <laughs> so um people just it, people came and they stayed so it was very very hard to get your foot in the door but i met a friend at baylor uh named meredith guter and she had just left southern living to go back to school and so she introduced me to her good friend martha johnston who was then the director of the Southern Living Cooking School, and it was a traveling show. You know, they would put on a stage show and make recipes for sponsors. And so Martha kind of took me under wing. I was the summer help. <laughs> and I, I learned the importance of typing a capital T versus a small T in a recipe that can really alter the salt intake. Um, so Martha really taught me the ins and outs of publishing because I didn't know anything. I didn't. I didn't know who did what at a magazine. I didn't know anything about magazine production. You know, I could write a decent sentence, but that was really about it. And so um, after I worked for her, she just pestered everybody here to hire me. And every time there was a job opening, she, she would call me. And so I started out here, uh, finally the right opening came along. Um, I started out in corporate communications. So I was actually promoting the magazines, doing PR for them and doing all sorts of other communications projects. Um, but along the way, I got to know a lot of the Southern Living writers. And um, I came here in 88, so a lot of the founding editors were still here. So, you know, to get to work with them and be trained by people who, you know, literally wrote the book on covering the South was just an amazing blessing. And um, so over the years, they would give me opportunities to write at the magazine and, um, so after about 10 years in corporate communications, I got involved with developing new magazines, did that for a little while. Um, and then they invited me to come to Southern Living Editorial, which I was terrified to do because back then, um, the staff was huge. I mean, it was over 100 people on that one editorial on that one magazine staff. So I was 
very terrified. Uh, but my friend Diane Young, who was a brilliant writer, um, said, you know, come on, <laughs> let's do this thing. And so um, she took me on a trip or two with her. And uh, so I watched her interview people. Um, a couple of the other writers would do little workshops with us, like Gary Ford, who's a wonderful Texan, who um, taught us interviewing skills. So just by watching them and learning from them, it was, you know, it was the best. So that's kind of been my journey here uh, in, in magazines. Uh, I left during the recession because it was terrible. You know, so many people were losing, losing their jobs. And I finally decided I would just leave rather than wait to see if I was going to be laid off, you know. So um, I freelanced for about five years. But then when Southern Living celebrated its 50th, they said, you know, why don't you come on back and help us with this project and then help us with that project. And then I keep you know, just putting my name on a door to, to make me stay. But um, it's, been, it's been great. The staff is much smaller now. All magazine staffs are a lot smaller now. Um, and they're all a lot younger than I am. But <laughs> I call myself Meemaw Val of Southern Living. But, uh, but that's been fun because, you know, they want to learn what I have to teach them about travel writing and heaven knows they can teach me so much about digital. You know, I didn't know anything about writing for digital and they completely taught me that. So this very old girl has learned a new trick or two, you know, so um, that, that it's been very rewarding. That's really great. I mean, to see that that in the Southern Living Magazine culture, I guess, you know, that that's the kind of dynamic you have where, where you're appreciated and you can appreciate those young it, whippersnappers. <laughs> yeah, it, it's an unusual place. It, it really is. Yeah. And, um, you know, there are things that are great about it now and things that were great about it back then. Uh, my first time here, uh, it was very multi-generational. You know, there were people here in their 60s and older, there were young people in their 20s. And so um, it was very much, you know, all over the board in terms of age, which has its merits, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now, most everybody is in their 20s, early 30s, maybe a little bit mm -hmm. older, um, except for me and one or two other people. But that youthful energy yeah. is, is fun. And um, so I, I learned a lot from them and I, I hope I'm able to mentor some of them. Um, at one time we had four young writers who were all doing their very first travel story. So, you know, I just put out my shingle and, um, <laughs> and, and they would come by when they had questions. Or so. But that's, that's rewarding because when you've been doing it long, you forget sometimes what it's like for it to be your very first trip, your very first interview, your very first, you know, time to book a flight for work or whatever. Um, so I really did enjoy that. I really did. That's really cool. And that's a good segue then into travel writing and, and travel tips, because, you know, that's one thing we wanted to talk to you about. I don't know of any people who are regulars in our writers chat community that do travel writing. And yet, I'm sure, you know, we all travel, right? I mean, we all go places. So how do we start incorporating our travel into, you know, maybe even making a little bit of money on the side and, and finding place, you know, just what, how would you advise someone just getting started? Uh, what we don't get anymore, and I don't understand how this happened, but, um, for me to get a story in the magazine as a staff writer, I have to have a focused angle. I can't just say, I'm driving through Georgia next week, can I do a story for you? I have to say, I would like to do a story about this particular coast and how it has shaped this, or how this culture in Georgia has shaped, you know, Jekyll Island or something like that. It has to be specific and it has to be something that hasn't already been in every other magazine. So what we often get that I know people think are pitches are really just descriptions of a place. It'll be, you know, I represent Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham has this and this and this and this and this. Well, I can't go to an editor with that. I, I have to go to an editor with, why is Avondale suddenly the, the neighborhood in Birmingham? You know, mm -hmm. I have to go to them with something that is 
specific and, and interesting. Or the, the other thing that, that people do that trips them up is they'll you have to remember with a magazine like Southern Living, we've been here for 50 years and we've been covering the same editorial territory for 50 years. So you can't come at us with, hey, the French Quarter is a really interesting place, you know, we've been there nine million times. Uh, but you can come at us with such and such chef has just moved into the quarter and all of a sudden things are shaken up. You know, you have to know something that's new and, and interesting and different in order to get it in there. Um, I think that it's really great when you can actually get boots on the ground travel information, which we have to have for print. Mm -hmm. um, there's a million digital outlets out there probably they don't pay a lot would be my guess um but you can see varying quality all over the board you know i can read some digital travel articles and just know that's not that's not really right so for us it's it's really important if you're trying to do travel to capture the spirit of the place and the flavor of the place and not just you know a list of restaurants and yeah. hotels or whatever you want we want to get it you know, why is this interesting? Why do the people who live there love it? You know, what's what's different about it? And that's been a really great feeder for fiction, which I never anticipated because we're trained at Southern Living to listen to how people say things, what they say, because we're trying to get at the distinctions between Texas and Georgia or Maryland and South Florida. And those areas are very distinct. There's not just one South. There's, you know, the culture, the accent, the food, mm -hmm. everything is really different from, from one area to the other. And so we're trying to listen to that. And that's been a real gift as I've tried to, you know, get into fiction is, is having an ear for that sort of thing. So really listen to people um, and how they say what they say and um, what their, how their sense of place shapes who they are and vice versa. You know, we're all about people in place and how they interact. Um, and I think that's one of the things that makes our travel coverage distinctive is we really are getting at, you know, how do these people shape this place and how did this, how did this place shape these people? Um, so I don't know if that's a very rambling answer. To that was a, no, that was a great, <laughs> great answer because I mean, there's just so many things that I want to go back to. So, and you know, I want Melissa and Norma to jump in too, too, with questions and comments. But um, okay, I'll go. I'll start with sense of place because to me that's like a very important thing to me too. My very first grad class, actually, I have a master's degree in liberal studies, but my first class was called a sense of place, and it was you know at Rollins College in Florida, and just you know, and you kind of know this stuff instinctively, but to actually study it you know, people, they eat the food that they can grow in that area. I mean, we don't so much anymore because we have these major supermarkets, but, but historically that's what you did and your clothes were, you know, because of what you were able to right. make, you know, and so it depended on what livestock you had. I, and it just is, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you just root your fiction in that too. I mean, it's got to be, um, it's, it's the geography, it's the climate, it's the, it's the food, it's, it's, it's the heritage, the festivals, all those, right. all right. those kinds of things. Well, you know, people <laughs> often associate Cajun food with fiery heat, but mm -hmm. Cajun food, that's, it's not how it's defined at all. Um, Cajun people always had to live off the land and a lot of them lived on the Louisiana prairie. You know, you always think mm -hmm. bayou, but not everybody was on the bayou. Some people were on the prairie. And so Cajun food is all about, I mean, it's the ultimate in local sourcing. It's what can you catch or grow mm -hmm. or hunt. Um, that's where their food came from. And so when you understand that, you can get a much better feel for, you know, their culture. There's a, there's a big difference between the beaches of the Outer Banks of North Carolina and the beaches of the Gulf Coast in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, I think people on the, the Outer Banks are very protective of their beaches. You know, you can sense the attitude of do not mess with our dunes <laughs> because their storms are so fierce. And that's literally, they're on that little spit of sand out in the ocean and that's what's protecting them. And so they're, I mean, you can sense that in the way they manage their beaches and the way they manage their tourism. So 
little bitty things like that can kind of tell you something bigger just about the power of the Atlantic um, and the importance of those natural protections that in many cases humans have destroyed. Um, so uh, it just kind of takes you back to how the land originally was. Yeah, yeah, it does, it does. And you know, when you're talking about different regions, I mean, like I lived most of my adult life in Florida and and we knew there, like you said, there were, you know, the South is different. There were, there's like three distinct Floridas. I mean, it's, there's South Florida, which is different than Central Florida, which is different than North Florida. And North Florida is actually more Southern mm-hmm. than South Florida, because South Florida has a big Hispanic influence and that Latino influence. So I'm, you know, so yeah, you've really got to know the place that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just, it's just so interesting to explore. I mean, I, when I first came back, I did three or four travel features on Florida and my husband went with me and we, we went to, we started in St. Augustine and mm-hmm. we drove all the way down to Marathon Key and then we came all the way back up. And it was just so much fun to, I mean, the, the keys are a totally different universe from everything else. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, um, I don't know if y'all have, have ever been to their, um, I, I don't know if they call it the writing seminar or writing conference in January. It's amazing. No. Um, yeah, I think it's called the Key West Writing Seminar. And it's every January. And they always do it on a specific topic. Like the year that I went, it was children's fiction, writing for children. And um, they have all these workshops where you write in the morning and then explore the island in the afternoon. And um, come back and read what you you'll get an assignment during every workshop in the morning and then you you do your assignment that afternoon oh and, that's cool yeah and you come back and read it to each other so um it, it's cool. it's really special plus it's it's balmy in the 70s and 80s in the middle of January <laughs> so what's not to love about that that's right <laughs> uh, Norma had a question in the chat but I'm just gonna have you ask it um um, what's one of the most interesting uh, articles that you've got, been privileged to write about? Very recently, I got to do how the civil rights sites of Montgomery are changing the city. Yes. And that was fascinating because um, the Equal Justice Initiative down there, uh, they're making a movie about Brian Stevenson, who heads that up. Um, and I got to interview him. And he's one of those people that it's just everything he says is interesting and quotable. And you, you, just, you you're, you're struggling with what am I going to leave out, you know, was good. So to, um, to tour that and to tour the church where Martin Luther King preached and to they, their tour guide there is Wanda Battle and Wanda is a force of nature. Um, she is just an amazing woman who is definitely not about just showing you around the church. She wants you to understand the message of Dr. King and, um, sharing love and giving love and it was just a it was a spiritual experience to tour that mm-hmm. so to get to really understand montgomery which you know all alabama kids go down there on a field trip <laughs> and so to understand the city and how it's changing and how it's really coming together and um and the city is really excited to have this national memorial there there are all kinds of young people doing interesting things so That was exciting for me to see, mostly because of the people that I got to talk to. Um, But then one of my all-time favorites is always going to be Acadia in Louisiana, because um, I love that story of how music is saving a language, because Cajun French almost died, and it was the popularity of the music. Um, And if you're singing Cajun music and you're not singing Cajun French, you're not legit. So it makes these young people learn that language and keep it alive. And I love to be a living language like that. We have a question in the chat, Valerie. What tips could you give us um, about writing query letters? And should they include photos? Photos, absolutely. Keep them short because um, I can't speak for other editors, but we used to have 13 or 14 travel and features editors. So we could have an editor for every state. Now we have two editors covering 16 states. So that gives you an understanding of the load that we're trying to carry together. Now we have an army of freelancers, which we didn't have when we had all of those. Everything used to be staff written. 
but now a lot of it is is freelance but we have to move very quickly so i come in in the morning and my email box is overflowing and so many people have not even taken the time to see what i cover mm-hmm. they just pitch to me and they're pitching me things on Switzerland, you know, and I write I said, what part of Southern is you? Um, but I you get there. I that. I'm not me, but I, we just don't have time to answer those. So if you're pitching me something that has never been in Southern living, just, you know, you're probably not going to get a response. And I, I feel like I'm being rude when I do that, but mm-hmm. it's just a function of time. So mm-hmm. you need to be very familiar with the magazine. You need to know what they cover. You need to, you know, have looked through a few issues or looked on their website. Um, and you need to keep your pitch short and sweet. And you need to make sure that you can get their attention in three seconds because that may be all that you have. So if I open up an email and it's this long of dense time, I just don't even read it because I don't have time, mm. you know. So it needs to be very short. Bullet points are great. Um, pictures are always good because they help me see what you see as the writer. And a lot of times they'll help me sell it to the editors because I'm the senior travel editor, but once it comes to me, it has to get through the executive editor and then it has to get through the editor in chief. So I have to convince a lot of people that this is worth doing. And I also have to convince the art department that there's going to be something to shoot this magazine's very visual. Um, so even if it's a great idea, but it will not photograph, then we can't go down that road because it's so expensive. So those would be my best tips is know a little something about who you're pitching to. Um, don't send the same pitch to everybody on the staff. Somebody did that yesterday. She sent the same pitch to five editors and they all forwarded it back to me <laughs> because it was a travel story. So now I'm bombarded with everybody else's copies of this, you know, just find out who you need to send it to and send it to them. Um, and, and just know that, you know, we're working under a lot, a lot of pressure and we have to work really, really fast. Do you have a tip for what would grab your attention in the subject line of an email? Hmm. Really just an interesting angle, you know, like um, a resort on the Outer Banks offered mermaid school and their tag was something like Standard Living Resort offers mermaid school and swimming pool or something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, you're at least going to open that. <laughs> yeah. so you're going to open that and find out what? You know? <laughs> So, um, and things not to do, we, we cannot cover hotel packages because every hotel in the South is offering a different package every day. Mm-hmm. And so if I see hotel package, I don't open it because I know I can't do anything with it. And I don't have time to go through that. So again, if you're familiar with the kinds of things they cover and a good tip that I give people is read our Facebook page because oh, good idea on Facebook, what we're promoting, and what we're promoting is generally what's being read. You can see what's getting shared and liked. You can see the kind of headlines that we write. Yeah. So, you know, it, a, a good rule of thumb is if you read that on Facebook, would you click on it? You know, and if the answer is no, then you need to change that headline um, because you have that much time to get their attention. So, yeah, Facebook is, at, look at our Facebook page, look at any magazine's Facebook page, because in our case, our site has been around a long time, mm-hmm. so there are some things still lingering on there that are, are dated that we just haven't had time to clear out yet, uh, but our Facebook page is all of our new material, so, and some of it's in the magazine, and some of it is created just for the web, and so mm-hmm. when you look on Facebook, when you click on it, it directs you to that article on our website. But Facebook is just a quicker way to see what's playing fast now. Great idea. Great idea. Um, I was going to go back to the photos for just a minute because you said that for us to send you photos helps you to see what, what there might be, what, you know, what we see. But if the photos aren't great quality, is that going to matter? Or are you going to have a photographer actually go and take the photos you need? And we just, these are just our photos just to kind of give you an idea. It depends. Um, okay. we, um, we do not shoot our digital stories. So 
if when you pitch a story you know, for digital, I'm going to say, I'll need a high res image for this. Okay. And most PR firms have those, most uh, convention and visitors bureaus, they're oh, going okay. to have that. Um, if you're pitching a print story, and I should say, we normally do not buy freelance for digital because we have a pretty, I mean, all the editors who write for print also write for digital. And we also have a handful of writers who only write for digital. So we don't generally pay freelancers mm -hmm. to write digital stories for us. For print, we're gonna shoot those stories. We're gonna go out and shoot them. So if you're pitching a print idea, I'm gonna need to see some scouting shots and they can even be screenshots. Okay. I just need for you to make it easy and quick mm -hmm. for me to see what that looks like. Um, because we're gonna always shoot our own. We don't, we rarely use any kind of pickup photography in print, but for digital, you know, we have to have an image for every digital story. And if we can't get one, we really can't do the story. Someone has asked uh, if you could define what you mean by a high resolution, like what numbers? Oh Lord, I think it's 300 DPI, I think. It's what that is. I've just been told to ask for high res. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's 300. <laughs> Dots per inch, isn't that what DPI is? I think it has to be at least 300. I'll Google that while we talk. <laughs> Do you have a question or comment? Yeah, actually, there was a question we missed a little while back okay. Rhonda asked. Um, going back to the topics that you write for the magazine, is there a way that um, people can search the archives of Southern Living to find what's been covered before so that they can find a fresh topic to submit? Um, let's see. You can definitely search our website. And it used to be that we we put all the articles from the magazine, or at least a lot of them, up on the website. There's no database for searching our existing articles um, that's open to the public that I can think of. But what I would say is, you know, go to a library or whatever if you don't want to buy the issues and just look through them. We have to revisit places, obviously, because mm -hmm. the states don't change, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we've got to cover Charleston. We've got to cover New Orleans. We've got to cover. We've got to cover Florida. We've got to cover the Smoky Mountains. So we're always going to go back to those in Texas. We have a big, big audience in Texas. So I'm not saying that we will never cover the same thing, but we need a fresh take on it. You know, we can't go back and do the exact same thing in New Orleans. And it helps you to kind of zoom in. I tell people for you know, use your Zoom lens instead of saying, wow, the French Quarter is great. You say such and such street on the French Quarter has suddenly become a hotbed for artists. You know, it, it needs to be something that has a little bit of a, a new spin to it or a new twist to it. Um, readers like Undiscovered, you know, if you, um, let's say you live in Charleston and you can do 10 things in Charleston you've never heard of or you know things like that you can give them the under the insider's guide to something um that's really helpful um readers love like a local you know they love you know where do the locals is in teach you know i know where the tourists go where do the locals go um so things like that they're always looking for that little hidden detail if that helps at all Oh. And sometimes it's just your gut as an editor. You just you just go, oh yeah, that's a story, and that which is <laughs> annoying for writers to hear. I know, but sometimes <laughs> it does come down to that. Well, Rhonda's got five years of Southern Living magazine on her bookshelf, so I think we could just <laughs> all make a trip to Rhonda's house. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Road trip. You know, yes. to, um, and we I, can look through them all. I used to do tours of our headquarters building a long, long time ago in my youth. And a lot of times somebody would ask me a question about a story and I didn't know where it ran. And another person in the group would go, oh, I've got that. That ran in 79 <laughs> or whatever. Oh <laughs> where is the headquarters? Is it in Birmingham? Yeah, Birmingham, Alabama. We've always been in Birmingham. We've moved to different buildings, but the mm -hmm. editorial offices have always been in Birmingham. Of course, we have sales offices like New York and Chicago. Mm -hmm. and. Um, but the magazine has always been here. That's a great, so, and, and then just to clarify, so there are freelance opportunities for, um, for writers? Yes. yes, for print. Mm -hmm, for the print. Uh, not so much for digital. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I don't know how other magazines do it, but that's that's us for the most part. Mm -hmm. We generally generally don't pay for freelance for digital because we do that in house, but we do pay freelancers for um, for print. And I don't know why this has come about. It used to be that freelancers pitched us ideas, and now a lot of them will email and say, "I'd love to write for you if you have a story I can do." Well, we're looking for ideas. Yeah. Um, we're looking for you to come to us with a great idea that we can develop. So um, one other thing with Southern Living is we do sometimes get pitches from folks who have never written before. And this is really not a magazine this size is not the place to do your first story. <laughs> so um, you have to have demonstrated. There are, there are some corporate rules about who can write for us. So you have to have demonstrated that you've written for a magazine this size before and that you have the experience necessary to, to pull off a Southern Living travel story. So um, I always tell people if you just decided you want to try travel writing, don't start with a huge magazine. Um, start with something local. There are all kinds of good regional magazines, city magazines, where you can kind of get your feet wet and, and learn what you're doing before you approach a larger publication. We have a couple questions in the chat. Renee was asking if um, you're only interested in uh, freelance from resident or can it be someone visiting? Um, would you take an article as a uh, somebody traveling visiting a, a place and their experience there or are you looking more for um, articles from people that that live in these particular areas no they don't have to live there um, but a, a pitch for a print magazine is actually fairly involved in that we want to shoot in season so for example, in April, we will be pitching summer 2020 because we want to get settled on which stories we need for next summer so we can shoot them this summer. And a lot of times I'll get, you know, an email, hey, I've got a great idea for May. Well, May is, <laughs> that's been done, you know. So you have to know that we work really far in advance on print and we almost never accept a story that's just sent to us, like here's a finished travel story, because we want to have some input into how that's shaped. So normally what you would do is pitch about a year ahead of time and give us your idea and your angle and what you can bring to it. And then the editors would evaluate it and decide if it's, if it's right for us. Okay, thanks. And Rhonda asked if there's opportunities for freelance outside of travel. Yeah, I mean, we do, we have homes and gardens and food and culture and beauty and style. So look at the sections of the magazine, as far as I know, all of them except freelance pitches. Okay. And you should send your pitch to, there's some, if you're not familiar with magazines, there's something called the masthead. that's mm -hmm. near the front of the book that lists all the editors. We don't run the masthead in every issue, but it was in our April issue. So if you look at April, which is our South Fest, it's a good one to look at. Um, you can see who the senior editors are. And that's really who you should address your, your pitch to, is the senior editor for each section. I appreciate you saying that about the magazine working so far ahead. I don't think, you know, we live in such a, a world where everything's instantaneous. I think we forget that, yeah, you're, you're, doing this so far ahead of time that's crazy wow and the exact opposite is true in digital because yeah what happens in digital is that our we have a the senior editors on that team they're constantly monitoring what's trending i mean in real time what's mm -hmm. trending what's getting liked and shared so let's say a pr person has pitched to me hey why don't you do this uh breweries and I pitch it to my editor and she goes, yeah, those are trending right now. And so I go back to the PR person. I say, I need images, but they don't get back to me for a week. Well, they may not be trending anymore. Mm -hmm. So you really do have to respond very quickly to uh, requests for digital. So, and I try to make that clear when they approach me. It's like, if you, if you want this, the story's on our lineup now, it may be off our lineup <laughs> next week. So if you want me to produce it this week, here's what I need from you right now. And so it moves very, very quickly, digital. But 
with with print, it's it's a big lead time because we have to send a writer, we have to send a photographer, we have to arrange all the shoots in advance because they're all set up in advance. They don't just flow into town and start, you know, aiming the camera around. So, um, so it's very, very involved to do a print sheet. Now, uh, the, another thing that I've been really impressed with, as you talked about your favorite articles, that these weren't just the fluff pieces. I mean, you know, and I think sometimes we think of travel writing as just, you know, this is really fun and go here for your vacation and all this kind of thing. But you're talking about some real in-depth, more almost like essays than just than articles. So can you just kind of talk about the differences, I guess, even sure. within travel writing? Sure. And our section is called travel and culture. Uh huh. It's not just travel, so it's also Southern culture. And my favorite stories, and the, which are like the ones I mentioned, are the ones where I can really dig in and, mm -hmm. and explore a place and, and study the culture. And the Louisiana story is a good example because I was sent there to do a story that was initially called um, something like Be a Cajun for the Weekend or Get in Touch with Your Inner Cajun. And it was supposed to be Ha Ha Fun. You know, and the more, I mean, I had been there maybe just a day or two and talked to a couple of people and I realized that was so disrespectful and so wrong and not at all where Southern Living needed to go. And I also realized I needed a year to get it right. So I called my editors and said, look, what we're planning to do is not good. And I would, I would like to make this a feature story. And they agreed uh, and said, you know, you know what you're, you, you're there, you're on the mm -hmm. ground. And so we turned it into this really one of my favorite pieces that interviewed some of the families of Cajun music. It's a, it's actually a very tight community of musicians. Um, we showed how the food and the music work together and how, um, how these wonderful people have managed to preserve their culture um, and yet be very welcoming there. I mean, Cajun people are just door wide open. Come on in, let's feed, let us feed you, you know, um, and listen to our music and dance a little bit, you know? So I, I love them. I love those people. I love their accent and hopefully was able to convey that. And, and that's really what we, we want to do. Uh, now we, we do some travel stories. We're always going to try to have some element of that in a story, mm -hmm. but there are some stories that run in the section versus the big, features um, that are more practical, that are more service oriented, like a city guide to, you know, New Orleans or Nashville or Dallas, you know, um, we're still going to try even in those to give you the flavor of the city and not just eat here, do this, sleep there. But some of those stories are more of got travel guide ish. If that makes sense. That's really cool. Have I missed any questions in, in the chat that we need to we did have one. Uh, yeah, do you make your themes available on your website? Renee was asking. I don't think so. I don't think there's any any kind of writer's guidelines on the website that I know of. Um, typically, a travel story is going to be between 700 and 1500 words. You know, we have had some people send us five or 6,000 words. <laughs> Can't do that in a <laughs> magazine. Um, so I don't think we have any kind of specific guidelines, but really for, for all the sections, you can you can look through if you if you look through maybe five or six issues, you'll see the columns that run every month. You'll see um, what a big feature story looks like. You'll see the components of it. Because even a a feature story like Montgomery that really had some some serious business about it and had some some in-depth cultural exploration in it we're still going to tell you what to see and do you know mm -hmm. so we're either going to do that in a sidebar or maybe we'll group all of that information together so that it doesn't interrupt the narrative mm -hmm. that's something that we work out together with the art department is do, do we need to just work this in or do we need to get the spirit of the place and then just put a you know maybe a one page travel guide at the end because you know there's always going to be a practical side to travel you've got to know where to stay you've got to know where to eat you know so we're going to tell you that but it just depends on the story where we put it oh that's great that's great wow one more thing i want to kind of go back to is i was looking up you know just different things on travel this morning too and 
one of the sites I was on was talking about use of language and and you've kind of talked about this too you know it, it was saying like you don't want to just use words like incredible or stupendous because what does that even mean and you know one of my little soapboxes on writers chat is it, most of us are most of the group are nonfiction writers but you have to know those fiction writing techniques <laughs> so even if you're writing nonfiction, and it's that kind of thing it's like being very specific with your words and you were talking about dialogue and it's like you know yeah you've got to know different dialogue how people sound all that kind of thing and that's you know a fictional technique so there again you know using fiction learning how to write fiction to better your nonfiction can just be be so important i'm going to ask everybody to come on in and you know if you have questions that you want to ask um valerie directly give you the opportunity to do that if you have trouble getting in let us know and we'll do our best to make sure you you do get in I, there's rhonda who i think is southern living's biggest fan on writer's chat <laughs> i love southern living i can't live without southern living where do you live i live in uh central kentucky in wilmore just south of lexington okay I, I just put in the zoom chat my my biggest moment was when i opened southern living and found a little paragraph about our independence day parade in my little hometown Awesome. And the, the lawnmower brigade, it's these guys in, in ties and sneakers, and they do marching band drills with their lawnmowers. And it's really interesting and fun. And, um, you know, I'm like, Wilmore, Kentucky is in Southern Living Magazine. We hit the <laughs> so. That's awesome. We try to hold on to that. We try to keep um, getting those local stories, whether we run them in print or digital, because that was such the bread and butter of the magazine. That's what the magazine is we were going to all these little towns that nobody else was covering nobody in new york was you know covering leapers fort tennessee <laughs> when we would show up and they would, their first travel editor would tell me he said you know we would show up and they would go well you think we're important enough to your magazine we're going to buy your magazine and it it really did help them build their audience wow wow one thing i would say in reading the travel articles which i do a lot I love the travel. That's just my favorite section, that in the home decorating section. But um, is I've gone to places simply on the recommendation of Southern Living Magazine. And one of the things I noticed is that often you'll have uh, flyouts that talk about accommodations and where you can stay and contact information mm -hmm. uh, for, for getting a hotel in the area. And, and uh, that I've always found really helpful. Oh, well, good. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Anyone have questions or, or other things they might want to comment on about the things we've been talking about? Yeah. Does someone say something? I guess one question I had, Valerie, was about um, the need for a, like a writing resume to be considered as a person who could write for Southern Living. Um, you, would, you would want to see what kinds of credits would you want to see to give us the credibility to get published in Southern Living? I think it would have to be um, some magazines with a national audience or at least a big regional audience um, or even a really reputable city magazine like Atlanta has a really good city magazine, something like Texas Monthly, which is a huge magazine. And it's not so much that I pay that much attention to. I mean, the first thing I look at is the idea, you know, and how well it's presented. Um, and then the second thing I look at is writing samples really before a resume or anything because I'm Interested in whether you can write or not. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. you, you could have gone to a small community college and be a great writer You could go to a great big reputable college and, and not really know how to tell a story. So um, I'm more interested in your writing samples and your idea But what we talked about a little bit earlier is our company which is called Meredith Corporation they have guidelines on what writers they will and won't accept. So you, I don't know, I should I, I wasn't aware this would come up or I would have looked it up, but <laughs> Google them and see just it's M E R E D I T H. They publish better homes and gardens They're based in Iowa. You can look on their website and, and maybe see if there's some writers guidelines there. If I find them, I'll email them to Johnny. Okay. So she'll know what they are. But I know when we were owned by time Inc, you, you had to demonstrate that you freelanced for a number of different clients. You had to prove that you had 
written for magazines as big as Southern Living. Whether or not that is all the same, I don't know. And they would only approve you for, you know, one thing. So sometimes I would have a writer say, I also take really great pictures, but they're only approved as a writer, then we couldn't accept their pictures. So it was, wow. it was, it was, it was pretty involved. Um, but that's the way it was under Time Inc. Now, whether or not Meredith has changed that, I don't know. Is that Meredith.com? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, um, if you're wanting to get involved in travel writing, I would think maybe your local newspaper might be a good place to get started. Um, yeah. If it's any size at all and they still have a travel section. Um, and that's also, probably where I would go. Yeah. Newspapers and, and local magazines because magazines are, have a slightly different story and a slightly different story than a newspaper would. Um, and also be aware of internet language. You know, there's some words and phrases, uh, Johnny kind of touched on this earlier. My number one pet peeve is insanely. It's insanely good. It's insanely beautiful. It's insanely this or that. You see that on the internet all the time, but you can't put that in a print article. <laughs> you know, you can't use, I have people pitch to me using text abbreviations. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, I'm too old. I'm not going to figure out what those letters mean. Um, so anyway, pay, pay attention to trendy language. If you sound like you're blogging to your friends, that's not the voice of a print magazine. So it is, it is a little bit more formal and it, it, you know, than say something you would do online. Wow. Wow. Well, that's all such great information. Anybody else have anything they want to, Add or ask while we have Valerie here. I'm going to give her, um, we've got a few more minutes. I'm going to give her an opportunity then to tell you about her fiction writing, um, which I got to talk to her about when I interviewed her before. She wrote a book called Missing Isaac, and then she's also written her latest book is called Almost Home. And maybe just to kind of tie this together, um, how did and perhaps it's just your own family history, but about how your story ideas came about and maybe how, you know, writing for Southern Living led you to, to think about this idea for your story. Though I do know that one little aspect of her one story came from a fairy tale, which has just been on my mind. I even went and, and looked up and read the fairy tale. So, so yeah, so just tell us a little bit about your, your fiction inspiration and, and how that all ties up in with your Southern culture. Okay. I just think so much of um, Southern culture is about storytelling. You know, mm -hmm. we're talkers, we can't shut up. Um, and we entertain each other with storytelling. That was especially true uh, growing up in the 1960s, as I did in rural Alabama. Um, three TV stations, one of them snowy, you know, something. <laughs> no internet, no cell phones. Yep. Rotary dial hooked to the, to the wall, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great times. <laughs> Great times. <laughs> we, we entertain each other by telling stories. And I grew up um, hearing tales about the farm and, you know, all that kind of stuff. My, my mother's family are cotton farmers and uh, have been there for four generations. Walls of the house where I grew up. Um, and I reflected on them, I think, over the years. And then... Um, there was one that I had turned into a short story when I was in college and then I would rewrite it and change it completely. And I did that over a period of um, I mentioned the recession, which hit magazines really hard and um, we lost hundreds of people and it just became a very difficult place to be and a very uncertain place to be. And um, I told Johnny when we talked about this earlier, I wasn't sleeping and by the time I had seen every law and order rerun ever made at three o'clock in the morning um I just said there must be something else I can do and so I did off that story and uh just sat down and started typing you know without a plan without any thought of marketing without even thinking about publishing it it was just I needed a creative outlet and I needed something that was all mine and that you know nobody else could take away or control or 
anything like that. And so it just became really my joy. And I would do that. I might write for two or three hours before I went into work in the morning. And so by the time I came into the office, it was sort of like, okay, I can deal with whatever happens because I've had this really joyful time this morning. And it was, it just really got me through. Uh, it did. Um, and then the more that I worked on it, I thought, well, maybe there is something here. And I would show it to a friend or two. And um, and then I enlisted a, a good buddy of mine who's a wonderful storyteller named Tanner Latham. And uh, Tanner and I would, I'd send him a few chapters and then we would meet at this cafeteria called the Paw Paw Patch and <laughs> order some fried green tomatoes and talk about my characters, you know? And uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. doing, working with a friend because he was just a great sounding board. And, um, and then I just started, you know, with my, I have a lot of friends who are good writers. And so I'd say, can I send you just a couple of chapters? Because I didn't want to inflict the whole manuscript on anybody in case it was really boring. <laughs> and, uh, but they would almost always ask for more. And I took that as a good sign that they all wanted more chapters. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I ended up meeting my agent through Southern Living. Everything has happened to me through Southern Living. Um, she was the uh, New York editor for their anniversary book, which I was sort of the anchor writer for. Um, and Leslie and I just hit it off and she had never represented fiction. All of her clients were nonfiction. And um, we went back and forth and I'll skip all the details, but anyway, she decided that if I was willing to go with a narrow market like Christian fiction, which mine just happened to fit, it wasn't intentional, um, that she would represent it because evidently general fiction is an enormous market and the editors change constantly. And she said, you know, I would have to hire people to manage you as a general fiction writer um, mm -hmm. because I couldn't track all those editors by myself. So she sent the book out she um, agent, you know makes their list and they send it out and then the the editor who called us back was in michigan but she loved the south <laughs> so um that's how the the first one came about and then they signed me to a contract for the the manuscript i had completed and then they wanted another book and then i just mm -hmm signed in the fall to do two more books for Revell Books at Baker Publishing. So they have been a great place to land, I have to say, because they are very supportive and their editors are great. And um, so it's been a, a really good experience so far. <laughs> and Valerie's experience is kind of different because she didn't do the whole platform building route. I mean, she's a strong writer, obviously, from her magazine experiences and then wrote an amazing story. and. So sometimes those things still do happen. <laughs> well, I was trying. Um, I wasn't really thinking that much about it as a fiction platform. But when I left Southern Living, I created a blog called Going Down to Mamas. And mm. I was going to try to build that into something. But what I didn't know at the time is that I knew absolutely nothing about social media. I knew nothing that I needed to be doing to make it grow the way that I wanted to. So the the earlier post to that blog it, it was going to be i wanted to make people feel like they were in the house with this circle of southern women i grew up with mm -hmm. so i would cook with my mother and my cousin would take pictures and we did all these fun recipes with my mother and we did lots of fun kinds of stories um but i was writing every day and then when it you know came down to i really need to start making a living here um, I, I only had time to write once a week and the column that everybody read consistently was called Sunday Morning Serenity and it was just a Sunday morning devotional. So if you look at the archives of the blog, it's all kinds of stuff, but for the past, I don't know how many years, it's, it's just that Sunday morning thing. So I really need to find a way to separate those two, but um, I'm technologically challenged as we all know, so I haven't found a way to do that yet. But yeah, I was just doing going down to Mama's for, uh, to see if I could build my own little thing, but I wasn't really considering it in conjunction with books. Yeah. Yeah. I love that name, going down to Mama. <laughs> Valerie, what's your blog address? I, it's just going down to mamas .com. and and it's on my website, which is Valerie Fraser. Let's see. <laughs> it's new, y'all. I don't I know. Say, my, you got your website up, yay! Because I, I know you I don't know my know. own web address. How sad is that? <laughs> let's see. I think it's Leslie Books. 
this is pitiful. I can't find my own website. No. <laughs> well, that's not it. It must be just ValerieFrazierLessie.com. Let's see. Okay, let's see if we can. Please don't tell my publisher. They will strangle <laughs> And we're recording this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So tell them. Now listen to the books. Yeah. Um, it's ValerieFrazierLessie.com. And oh. my blog is on there. Yeah. Can someone put that down in the chat? It's L-U-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. We want to make sure we, we spell her, her last yeah. name too. We really, I mean, we really should be wrapping up, but I've got, I just really, really quick, just like in a minute, tell, tell us about your story shack. Oh, my story shack. Well, right now I'm in my office at Southern Living. Yes, but my story shack, um, I tried to take over my husband's office when I started freelancing and he, for some reason, was against that. <laughs> and so he was going to build me something and he decided to build it in the yard to get me as far away from him as he possibly could. So we were trying to uh, settle on what the office should be. We stumbled onto this cute little cottage in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and we both went, oh, that's it. It's this tiny little shotgun cottage with gingerbread trim on the front and a little bitty front porch. And he built a really scaled down version of that for me or had it built. And we just sort of filled it with treasures. Like he made it soundproof because I had annoyed him so much telling him I had to have quiet. And then uh, we put glass on the front. So it's got a glass door and a picture window. It has a display shelf up around the vaulted ceiling where I have all kinds of treasures for my grandmothers and people who are special to me. The ceiling is painted haint blue, which is a Southern thing. You, you paint your um, porch roof haint blue to keep the bad spirits away. But I think it's also supposed to keep birds or bugs or something away. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just got all these things that I love that inspire me. Um, it's got a pretty little hardwood floor and a velvet chair for my cat, Cheeto. <laughs> um, and, um, books everywhere and uh, I just love it. It's the perfect place to write. I can, I have a, a flower pot out front, which I, it's covered with weeds right now, but I need to do something about that. But it's just a very happy place. And, and my husband is protective of it. He doesn't come out there. That's my place, you know, unless I need him to, he leaves me out there to do my thing. And uh, we had some sweet retiree neighbors who called it my little playhouse. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of is. <laughs> and is it your, uh, the screen door from your, is it from your grandmother? Or my my grandmother's house, uh, the screen door that was on the front of her house and the house deteriorated, but I saved the door and we took the screen out and then I painted it. The story shack's chocolate brown on the outside. So I painted the screen frame bright blue and our friend who built the shack nailed it to the outside and then my husband built a step to go under it and then we put some little metal flowers beside it so it's kind of like having the front of my grandmother's house on the side of my shack i just love it i love it <laughs> it just touches my heart in such a <laughs> it really does thank you so much uh, yeah. well thanks everybody for coming valerie this has been fabulous thank you so another fun thank you for having me Oh, we're so glad you joined us today and, and you're talking about your experiences with Southern uh, Living Magazine. And, um, you know, if you're here today, thank you for, for joining us live. If you're watching on the replay, we appreciate you too. Uh, you're welcome to join us live anytime that you can. We are here every Tuesday morning at 11 Eastern, 10 Central. And just thanks to everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>